The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Coming up on the agenda. There are parts of the country where property is already tough to insure because of uh, the risk of loss is high and the reconstruction costs are also rising. Insurance is a business, you know, if premiums collected by a company can't cover its payouts and expenses, it quite rationally will exit those markets. Then, if you have a basement flood with sewage in your basement, I mean, it's, it's a disaster. People lose their possessions and they get PTSD. It's just a terrible thing. That's ahead on the agenda. What used to be unusual or rare weather events seem to happen more and more. Major rainstorms, wildfires, hot and cold spells that upend expectations, and more costly, crops. Damages tally in the billions each year, and experts say that's only going to increase. With us now on whether that could end up making Canada uninsurable, we're joined in Edinburgh, Scotland by Craig Stewart. He's Vice President for Climate Change and Federal Issues at the Insurance Bureau of Canada. In London, Ontario, Daniel Henstra, Professor of Political Science and co-lead of the Climate Risk Research Group at the University of Waterloo. And here in our studio, Catherine Backus, Director of Climate Finance and Science at the Intact Centre on Climate Adaptation, which is also at the University of Waterloo. And Catherine, we're delighted that you are making your television debut with us here tonight, uh, in a studio anyway. And Craig and Daniel, thanks for joining us in Points Beyond. Let me just set up our conversation with this. And Sheldon, maybe you could bring these stats up for everybody at home to follow along as well. The number of natural disaster claims for events such as hurricanes, floods, hailstorms and wildfires has more than quadrupled since 2008. Last year, weather events accounted for $3.1 billion of insured losses. That is up from just $40 million in 2008. House insurance prices in Canada have gone up by about 14% over the past three years, with premiums skyrocketing by 5% in just the past 12 months alone. In 2019, Charles Brindamore, who is the CEO of Intact Insurance, said, we had to totally reshape our business model to make sure we had a sustainable business in the context of massive changes in weather patterns. The insurance industry knows. Okay, Craig, get us started here. How would you characterize the impact climate change is having on the insurance industry in Canada today? Well, you know, uh, you've just gone through the, the stats. I mean, Canada is becoming a more difficult and pricier place to insure relative to other countries in the world. Uh, we've, we've all been experiencing these events firsthand. Um, the, you know, Canada is still, for the most part, insurable, but we are seeing, you know, certain perils such as flooding, uh, where, you know, high-risk areas in this country really haven't been insurable and uh, and since 2013 insurers have really clarified we're, we're not going to go there uh you know and, and that affects you know over 1.5 million homes across this country already catherine let me follow up on that because that sounds incredible there are parts of this country that are uninsurable today Correct. As, as Craig was saying, 10% of Canadian homes across Canada are uninsurable for flood risk, which means they can still get home insurance, but they're not covered if they have a major flood event caused by an extreme weather event. And the insurance companies have determined that these places are uninsurable. Why? They've obviously done the statistics, they've run the calculations, but I believe we're actually in a very good place here in Canada because we've actually developed well-informed standards, guidelines and tools to build a more resilient Canada. We know what to do at the level of the home and community to reduce these key physical climate risks, flooding, wildfire and extreme heat. What we need to do is deploy them across Canada as quickly as possible to maintain that insurability and stability of the Canadian housing market. More on that as we continue our conversation. Uh, Daniel, why don't you come in here? Tell us how you see the scene right now. Sure. I mean, it's concerning that there are parts of the country where property is already tough to insure because of uh, the risk of loss is high and the reconstruction costs are also rising. Insurance is a business. You know, if premiums collected by a company can't cover its payouts and expenses, it quite rationally will exit those markets. 
And as Craig and uh, Catherine have said, fortunately, Canada's insurance market hasn't seen the same volatility as in the United States, but we can't be complacent. You know, climate risk is real and it's increasing and we need to manage it. Well, since you mentioned the United States, let me give an example here from California, where apparently State Farm has recently announced that it's going to stop selling new insurance policies because of the increasing likelihood of wildfires. Um, okay, Craig, follow up on this, if you would. Are there pla Where are the places in Canada right now where the risk of wildfire is so concerning that we may be going down that road as well? Well, we haven't really seen it in any part of the country yet. Uh, luckily for us, wildfire is still considered an accident no matter where you live in the country. Our emergency response, frankly, has been excellent. Uh, you know, in 2018, all of the interior of British Columbia burned, but we lost only 300 structures. You saw the response earlier uh, this year in Nova Scotia. But we're pretty good at limiting damage. So, so far, the country, uh, in terms of wildfire, no particular part of the country is viewed by insurers as uninsurable now or in the near future. But, you know, that could change. Well, that's comforting news. But on the other hand, Daniel, uh, do you think it's fair to say that these extreme weather events are only going to be increasing in number as we go forward? That's certainly what's projected. We're going to see drier, you know, warmer, wilder conditions. And uh, we need to make sure that we're implementing all the tools that we can, as Catherine said, to make sure that we're building resilience in this changing climate. Catherine, how much do you think homeowners understand what's going on out there right now? I think there are limited, uh there's limited information available that is up to date that can inform in uh, homeowners of what is actually going on. I think there's a great opportunity in Canada to provide more information to identify where risks are. We could have a portal where you could put in your postal code to be able to identify what the key risks are within a given community. You don't have that yet? We don't have that yet. Who should do that? Uh, I'm sure Craig could speak to that probably a little bit better, but I think this is an all of society approach. We need all levels of government. We need public and private partnerships. We need to be updating risk maps. So if you look at flood risk maps across Canada, they're 20 to 25 years out of date. Hmm. But in my opinion, that's only one part of the puzzle. We need to identify the risks and what risks are within given regions, but we also need those resources to tell people what to do about it. Because we can't just say, well, you have a risk and do nothing about it. You need to identify those risks and what resources are available to reduce those risks. Craig, that idea, put your postal code into a website, seems pretty simple. How come we haven't got that yet? Uh, you know, it's a super interesting answer. Uh, you know, it was actually funded in the federal budget about three years ago, four years ago. Uh, Public Safety Canada looked into it at that time, ran into issues of liability concerns, had to take a step back, and then uh, has now reapproached it. And in the most recent federal budget, uh, in fact, funding was announced for that exact portal. Uh, they're hoping to get it up and running uh, over the next two years. They're going to start with flooding, but make sure that it can be expanded to address other other risks and you know Catherine is dead on the you know it starts with consumer awareness it starts with Canadians being able to quickly access information about what the risk is and what they can do about it and uh, and and uh, answer your question federal government obviously is is the best best place to take leadership but we all have a responsibility in in uh, in communicating you know whether you're a bank a realtor, an insurer, we should all be reinforcing this information in our in our regular contact points with our customers. Okay, well, Daniel, maybe you could build on that. It, uh, it, clearly, it sounds like the feds ought to be taking the lead on this, but uh, where are they getting all the information from across the country in order to ensure that people get the best, most accurate information they can in a timely fashion? It certainly is a problem. You know, we did a survey a number of years ago of Canadians living in high risk areas and almost nobody knew they were exposed. They hadn't bought flood insurance, hadn't protected their home in any way. So there's a real information deficit. And you know, insurers and governments kind of have a monopoly on the technical data that just isn't being available to Canadians. And to be, uh, to their credit, insurers have been making this case for years to governments that we need this information. The federal government's listening. It's made new uh, flood maps in high-risk areas, and the plan is to make these available to Canadians. But there's other things we can do, too. 
property sellers or their agents could be required to tell buyers about flood risk, whether the home's flooded before or if it's in a flood area. Mortgage lenders could insist that uh, buyers have flood insurance. We should be preserving natural flood protection like wetlands. And in some cases, we have to move people out of harm's way by offering to buy out risky properties. Who's the we who has to buy out risky properties? This means governments could mean federal and provincial governments will, in some cases, uh, have to put money on the table to move people out of areas that are just too dip too dangerous to live in. Hmm. Catherine, um, okay, how do I put this? Because I don't want to insult anybody here because real estate agents, they have a difficult job to do, and but their job at the end of the day is to sell a place. Uh, can you imagine a set of circumstances whereby real estate agents are going to let people know, oh, incidentally, I'm trying to sell this home, but you're on a floodplain and there's a great likelihood that you're going to be at risk of flooding in the future? Well, I think it's actually quite simple. I think when you're looking at a multiple listing service, uh, the, the one page that gives you the description, how many rooms the house has, how many bathrooms it has, I think there could be a very simple indicator. If we're looking at flooding, has the house installed a sump pump or a backwater vault? Yes or no? That shows that there are flood protection measures at the level of the home. And I think we will come to a point where we need to be disclosing this information. We're seeing across Canada class action lawsuits. There's mm -hmm. one going on uh, in Oakville right now. Uh, I believe it's a $2 billion class action lawsuit. Tell me more about that. What's going on there? The municipality, the mayor, the conservation authorities, they're all named in this lawsuit because the homeowners feel that development occurred. It, uh, there was widespread development. Development occurred on floodplains. And now these homes are either being flooded out or they're being devalued. So they, they unknowingly purchased homes in a floodplain and now they're in trouble. Correct. So I think we can start small um, on those MLSs. Again, what are risk reduction measures that have been put at the level of the home? But I think from a larger scale, we do need this risk identification on a larger scale. Are you purchasing a home in a floodplain? And if you are, have risk reduction measures been put into place? Hmm. Craig, how about, I appreciate that you think the federal government's got to take the lead on this, but I, I guess you represent all of the privately owned insurance companies across the country. Country, should they have to make, should you have to make your data publicly available as a, as I guess, a partner in all of this? The answer is uh, yes. Uh, insurers have a role to play in making sure that um, uh, our customers understand why they're paying the premiums that they're paying. Uh, what What is the risk that uh, that our consumers are facing and upon which their premiums are based? And in fact, insurers are working constructively actually with the regulatory community across the country right now to do exactly that. We're taking a look at ways at which the premium renewal point, uh, we can we can all do a better job at reinforcing that 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 communication of risk to to consumers. A key piece of this, and and uh, and Catherine alluded to it, is you know how do you rate a home? Like we, we we've got energy efficiency ratings for a home right now, right? We an energy people are familiar with Energi, the home Energi system. Uh, so we have it on energy efficiency, but we don't have it on resilience. So how and and in fact, uh, Minister Wilkinson uh, again, Minister of Natural Resources, it's in his mandate letter. We need to develop some sort of home rating system for resilience uh, that we can use, that we can all use to say yes. Uh, you know, if you take a look at, you know, your your fire rating or your flood rating or your, you know, your wind rating, um, you know, and then roll that up into some sort of overall resilience rating. If we can do that, and, and then we can suggest to homeowners, these are the steps you can take to improve your rating. That's something that insurers can use. That's something that uh, banks could use. And it's certainly something that realtors could use as well when they're listing a home uh, to say, this is the rating of this particular property. And, and that would provide the incentive system at both the municipal level and at the homeowner level to, to, to make sure we're, we're taking the steps necessary to protect ourselves. Well, Catherine, let me come at this from another angle, which is there's not a politician alive in this province today that, uh, well, some days you think doesn't want to pave over absolutely everything in order to build more housing, right? we got a desperate need for housing with all the new people coming here. But if I hear you right, there are places in this province where we just ought not ever to build a house going forward. Is that right? 
Correct. We need more homes in this province. And in my opinion, every Canadian, every newcomer to Canada deserves access to affordable and diverse housing. But whether it's a new community or an existing community, in my opinion, all communities should be designed, built and retrofitted with adaptation or resilience measures to reduce extreme weather risk. What does so that do, mean, adaptation measures? So are we putting, uh, are we putting downspouts on uh, homes? Are we ensuring there some pumps in all homes and back wet or oh, valves? Yeah. Are we putting measures to reduce the risk at the level of the home and community? So do we need more homes? Yes, of course we do. But if we're building those homes and communities without resilience measures in extreme weather risk prone areas, so as you said, building on floodplains, mm -hmm. then we could actually be putting those homes and communities into harm's way. And we could actually be inflicting greater financial and social costs on those individuals. So mm -hmm. making sure our communities have measures put into place to reduce those risks and then providing educational tools to homeowners so they can make changes inside of their homes and outside of their homes to reduce risk. Daniel, does this sound to you like we need more and better provincial regulation to ensure what Catherine wants comes to pass? You know, the Climate Risk Research Group, we're thinking all the time about policy tools that can be used to manage climate risk, and the government has all sorts of different instruments in its toolkit. It could use, uh, and to, in this case, to get builders to integrate climate resilience into this new construction. This is an opportunity. Things like improving energy efficiency are using fire and water resistant materials. Governments could use a persuasion campaign. They can recognize exemplary efforts, use economic incentives. But as you say, it might require regulation by changing the building code to require certain practices or materials. Uh, to make sure that uh, homes are resilient. And it also speaks to the need to educate citizens on climate risk when they're making property decisions. I mean, it's nice to have a home with granite countertops, but are you going to be shoveling mud off the basement carpet when it floods? <laughs> that, that is the $64,000 question, isn't it? Do you have any sense about whether or not the province is considering some of these measures you just mentioned? The province has a guidance instrument called the Policy Planning um, statement uh, and it's used to or planning policy statement sorry and it's used to guide planning of municipalities and it recently has been updated to integrate climate resilience and climate adaptation as priorities when making decisions about the siting of properties and uh, rules about materials and those things that are uh, to be used. The concern is always around affordability. Is this going to raise the cost of construction? And in some cases, it certainly will, and that cost will be passed on to consumers. So governments have to be careful about thinking about equity and making sure that any new policy changes are going to be, uh, are not going to have an uh, undue impact on lower income households. Well, that's the trick, isn't it, Craig? I mean, you've got to, I mean, all the incentives seem to be lining up in one particular fashion these days, which is build, build, build as fast as possible and not necessarily taking into account all the things you've mentioned. How do we get this stuff on the agenda as well? No pun intended. Well, we need to, we, we absolutely need to be careful about where we build and how we build. And, uh, and, you know, this is, there's, there's no point building homes uh, in harm's way that taxpayers are then going to have to bail out uh, afterwards. Uh, you know, we've done a, not a great job of that in the past. Uh, again, we have one and a half million homes in high risk uh, flood areas already. Don't want to add to that. Uh, and so we, we, we need to be careful of it. The, the decisions we're making. Uh, and, and as Catherine said at the start of the show, we know how to build these. We, we know we know how to build wildfire resistant homes. We know how to build flood resistant homes. You know, pretty simple to put hurricane clips on and to keep roof, roofing joists on uh, on a roof when uh, in the middle of a severe wind event. It's not an expensive thing to do. Best time to do it is actually when you're building the house. So we, we know the things, the very specific things to do. And if we're going to be building this many homes, which clearly we need to do, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be really important that they're done right. Catherine, can I just follow up on that? I get, I get how you make a home more resilient as it relates to flooding. If there's a wildfire around your home, how do you make a home that's more resistant to that? There is actually resistive siding that you can put onto a home and a post analysis was completed in Lytton, British Columbia. And what they determined was that 
uh, wildfire was an extreme event. It was an extreme wildfire that had devastating impacts. And yet after the post-fire analysis, it was determined that the fire resistive siding on the homes, which actually retrofitting a home costs a lot of money, but building a home from scratch with the proper materials could be approximately equivalent to building a home normally without the fire resistive materials. Having those fire resistive materials made a difference in whether a home burned down or not. So it, it can actually prevent the home from burning down in the midst of a wildfire. Correct. And there are measures around the home as well. Moving shrubs and bushes 10 feet away from the home, putting a metal roof. So if you have a uh, little debris falling onto the roof, this will actually stop your the, the, the roof, the home from igniting. And so there are practical things to do for homes located in the wild and urban interfaces, urban areas near forested areas. We can have breaks where you actually uh, mow over the lawn and so you create a break between the wildland urban interface and, and the urban area. So there's much we can do within forested areas to protect homes and communities. This seems like such common sense. I mean, the, the stuff that you're telling me right now is not all that technical. Why are we not doing it? Well, that's exactly it. It's We have created the, we've done the research. We know, as Craig said, at the level of the home and community, we know what to do in regards of flooding, wildfire, extreme heat, deploying that information, mobilizing on that action is what we actually find to be the most difficult thing. And this is where I believe it's an all of society of approach. All levels of government, businesses, the media, academics, indigenous communities, we all need to be part of this conversation and we all need to be part of mobilizing action. I guess part of the trick here, Daniel, is that is that there are so many things these days that require an all of society approach and the public's bandwidth to deal with, you know, half of them, a third of them is only so much. What do we do about that? Well, one of the things we need to do is to have uh, strategies. And as you probably know, yesterday, the federal government published its final version of the National Adaptation Strategy. And it's a very detailed document, sets out eight action areas like disaster resilience, health and well-being, critical infrastructure and others, and dozens of specific ambitious targets to meet these objectives. Uh, so the plan is in place, and now it's about getting budget towards it and implementation and engaging all of the stakeholders, a lot of which has already been done because this is not just a, a federal document. It's a national strategy. Um, but there are things that can be firmed up as well. For example, the Canadian Climate Institute has recommended specific things like better monitoring and evaluation mechanisms to make sure that we're meeting the targets, coordination mechanisms to make sure that all departments are guided towards this central goal. So there are things that we can improve, but this is a massive step forward. Well, let's talk for a second here, Craig, about, um, and I guess I'll use the analogy of auto insurance here. You know, there are some drivers who are pretty terrible and the private market will not deal with them. And so they got to go to the facility association and that's where they get their auto insurance because you're obliged, if you want to drive in Ontario, to have auto insurance. Okay, do we need something similar like that for homeowners who will not be able in the future to get private insurance for their homes because of all of what we've been discussing? It's the first time in a media event or interview that I've, I've, I've heard anybody mention the Facility Association. So uh, well, I hate to tell you, Craig, yeah, I only know about it because I've been on it. And I hate to admit that, but there you go. <laughs> Uh, you're absolutely right. So the facility association is a great model. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, in the spring, uh, you know, due to Minister Blair's hard work, uh, the federal government did announce that they were going to stand up a national flood insurance program for the country, which is sort of a, fil a facility association for high risk homes. Uh, so for those 10% uh, of homes that are una unable to get overland flood insurance today, uh, the plan is that by 2025, there will be a new government government-backed insurance program uh, that will make insurance available for those homes. So they're not relying on taxpayer bailouts. They're actually they actually have an insurance facility uh, that will meet their needs and help them to reconstruct after an event. And the important part of this is that it will be expandable. They're, they're looking at, they're going to design it to handle flood first, which is a, the biggest problem we're all facing from an insurance perspective. But if we if we get to the point where we've got high risk wildfire areas in the country that can't be insured through the private market or or other perils, uh, hail, uh, wind, then then this facility could be expanded to also address those perils as well. All right, let's talk cities for a second here, Catherine. Uh, I don't have to tell you, we just had an election in Toronto in which the issue of a billion and a half dollar 
hole in the budget means the city has no money to do anything. Uh, so, I don't know, can cities do anything? I know Burlington's doing some stuff. Do you want to talk to us about Burlington? Well, Burlington, after 2014, they had a major flood event due to a high precipitation event that flooded out 3,500 homes. And from an in infrastructure perspective, Burlington has been doing wonderful things. They've been ripping up their piping systems and ensuring that there's larger capacity for rainwater and sewage to run through those systems. Who pays for all that? The taxpayers do. Of Burlington? Correct. Okay. But at the end of the day, there are things that can be done for limited to no cost at all. At the Intex Center on Climate Adaptation, we have developed three steps to cost-effective home flood, wildfire, and heat protection infographics. We've been working with cities across the country, from Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, Oakville, the town of Antigonish, the, the, the county of Antigonish. And what they've done is they've adopted our infographics, they've translated it into their own city specific infographics with their own photos and logos and it's the cost of a piece of paper and you put it into the property tax mail out notice and you mail it out to the constituents. Do they read them? They do. Uh, our work with the Canadian Red Cross, we've determined that 70% of homeowners who report receiving this infographic implement at least two of the actions within six months. Huh. So we know it is a useful tool to not only identify risk but also to reduce the risk. Well Daniel this does get down to the bottom line here which is how much of this is ultimately the response of the homeowner to take care of as opposed to governments, academics, media, etc., to let them know what's going on. More responsibility has to be on the property owner. And, you know, the governments uh, have been moving in this direction. Certainly, uh, disaster financial assistance programs all say that it's for uninsurable, unexpected losses. So there has always been an expectation that citizens would inform themselves. But the argument uh, my group has been making to governments is this is premature. Unless you make the climate risk information available, easily available to citizens and understandable, it's unfair to expect them to take on a greater role. But there is information available. As Catherine has just said, there are practical things that homeowners can do to protect their home from flooding and from wildfires and other perils. And in many cases, they don't do them. And that's partly a lack of awareness, but it's partly just not thinking ahead to the types of risks that can happen. I guess, Catherine, in our last minute here, the key is just be aware that this is going on and that you need to take steps to deal with it. Correct. Yeah. And that there are measures in place that, or there are resources available that you can put measures in place to reduce those Where risks. Where do we see those infographics? You can go to the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation web website under reports and resources and the infographics are right at the top. We have them for flood at the level of the home, wildfire for home and community, and extreme heat at the level of the home and apartment and condo. That sounds like a very useful thing to have. Yes. Okay, we will be checking that out. I want to thank uh, the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and helping us out with this. We learned a lot about something that we're going to need to know more about going ahead, particularly as the summer comes and we get those flash floods and rainstorms and so on. Uh, we need to know about this. Craig Stewart coming to us from Edinburgh, Scotland. He's the VP of Climate Change and Federal Issues at the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Daniel Henstra from London, Ontario, professor of political science and co-lead of the Climate Risk Research Group at the University of Waterloo. And here in our studio, Catherine Backus, Director, Climate Finance and Science, Intact Center on Climate Adaptation. That's where you'll get those infographics. Also, University of Waterloo. Thanks so much, everybody. Take good care. Thanks very much. Thank you. Every June for the last 21 years, a group of farmers in the township of Lincoln in the Niagara region have taken the issue of water scarcity into their own hands. Adapting to climate change and extreme weather like droughts means farmers like David Hippel have had to develop creative solutions, like laying large aluminum pipes all the way from Lake Ontario to his farm, roughly four kilometers south. So this would be one of the smaller ones? Yeah, right? usually this is probably from one that is to line up with the, with the connections. We have a mix of 40 foot and 30 foot lengths. I think there's three or 400 of them that we have to connect together. Hey! That means feeding pipes through culverts and vegetation and under railroad tracks and even a six lane highway, the QEW. It takes six of us 
two full days between driving trailers around, filling trailers, unloading trailers, connecting pipe. And at the end of the season, David and his team have to repeat the process in reverse, packing up the pipes so they don't burst from the looming cold winter weather. It's labor-intensive work during an especially busy time for farmers like Hippel, Can go in the ditch more? who has roughly 60 hectares of land to cultivate. He's an eighth-generation farmer, and the plot of land has been with the family since the early 1800s. Back then, it was a self-sustaining farm, full of livestock, fruits, and vegetables. Today, the farm acreage is dedicated to tender fruit and grapes. We have peaches and nectarines and apricots and yellow plums and blue plums and sweet cherries and sour cherries and pears, and uh, we have table grapes and wine grapes. The farm is also fitted with a giant pond spanning one hectare, four meters deep, and holds about 18 million liters of water. It's the main source of water for the farm's drip irrigation system, but that is not enough. You fill it up hopefully in the winter, and once that storage was gone, we were done irrigating for the season. Didn't matter if that was June or September. There's years it's been both. But we've realized we were only doing 50% of what we had because we didn't have the water. In prime growing season, Hippel estimates he would need about 15 liters of water per tree per day. And with about five to 700 trees a hectare, you don't have to be good at math to know that adds up quickly. And for a region that's known for growing tender fruit and grapes, it's a problem many farmers must contend with. Most tender fruit in, in Canada is grown here. 95% um, in Ontario is in the Niagara region. Water is an important part of the equation in farming. The one variable, and one that's getting harder and harder to predict, is weather. Drought-like conditions, heat waves, prolonged rains, and early frost can do serious damage to a farmer's crops. Well, we certainly demonstrated the impact of, uh, of drought in 2016. That was a drought year. Basically, it reduced the crop size by about 25% but it also decreased the crop value by about 30%. What many consumers may not know is tender fruit in Canada is federally regulated and must be a certain size before it can hit store shelves. Peaches, for example, need to be a minimum of 5.4 centimeters in diameter before they can be marketed. So if you don't have irrigation, you don't make that size, that fruit becomes lost. So that's food waste, lost revenue. We calculated out the difference uh, and value, gross value to the crop in that drought year was about 15 million. The irony of it all is the Niagara region is surrounded by fresh water. Lake Ontario to the north, the Welland Canal and Niagara River to the east, and Lake Erie to the south. What's frustrating for the farmers is they see all the water around us, the envy of the world right here with all the water and we're not getting it to our trees. When you're working with a system that you're going to need for an entire season and it requires assembly as though it were building blocks. There's something absolutely uh, impractical about that. For nearly two decades, farmers and local politicians have been pushing for a permanent irrigation network that would connect farmers to a consistent source of water. The plan is finally gaining momentum. This is infrastructure. This is pipes in the ground. It may not be your traditional definition of pipes in the ground, but it's pipes in the ground. The future generation will be upset at us if we don't get water to our farms here in Niagara. We have a lot of growth in our communities in the GTHA, and we have to make sure that there's food to feed families. We're supposed to feed the nation, and we're happy to do that, but we need the tools to, to get us to that point. The current proposal is to create a region-wide system which farmers, both small and large scale, could buy into and take water. It would see a grid of buried pipes delivering water to Lincoln and St. Catharines. Installing an irrigation system of such scale will require a lot of money, and details about how the water will get to farmers still needs to be hammered out. You know, you're, if you're coming from the lake, then you are, you're gonna need pumps um, because of the elevation. Uh, ideally, if we could do it using gravity, gravity-fed systems from the escarpment, that would be probably the least expensive and the less energy required. You don't have to travel far to see an example of a fully functional irrigation system. Parts of Niagara-on-the-Lake currently use an open-ditch system. 
So right now we're in the village of Queenston. Uh, we're right down by the Niagara River, which is you know very close to uh, Lake Ontario, which is just down at the mouth there. The two pumps, uh, 6,500 gallons a minute, uh, would go through these. Uh, one really is uh, offsets the other, so I, I don't run pumps, you know, 24/7. The system consists of pumps that push water to supply channels, that then flow into a series of drainage ditches that farmers can then tap into. So we draw out of the Niagara River here beside us and about uh, 25 feet off there's intake structure that's down below, about, it sits about 25 feet below the water here and it draws the water up uh, through the two pumps that we have on the inside here. The town has similar pump houses across the municipality. In its simplicity, the system works well, but it does have its challenges. For one, the system doesn't reach all of Niagara-on-the-Lakes farmers, and secondly, the cost to use the system can be difficult for small-scale farmers to absorb. There is also the issue of regular maintenance of the ditches. One of the biggest problems has been the invasive Phragmites, a dense, fast-growing perennial grass. What Phragmites does in a channel, what would have to happen, and in a standard one meter wide channel, they said to get the same volume of water through a one meter channel, the channel would have to be 10 times as wide. So you can tell when you have a kilometer of Phragmites and it's so aggressive that it's choking out the systems. Regular maintenance is something Hippel knows all too well with his system in Lincoln. There's always the unexpected, either you know a pipe wears out and it bursts, you gotta pull it out and replace it, or someone, you know, some fun throw rocks at a pipe and it bursts, or car accident drives in the ditch and bursts the pipe. When it comes to a regional irrigation network, the hope is to get shovels in the ground in a couple of years. The system will have its challenges and deal with barriers like highways, railroads, the unique topography of Niagara, and support from all levels of government. And such an undertaking that's permanent, affordable, and reliable will need to happen soon. I don't think we've got a whole lot of time to fool around. If we continue to have major droughts and we don't have water, to support um, our farmland, then there just isn't going to be food in the future. It's going to be so costly that it's going to be even more of a hardship than it is now. With the summer upon us, a lot of Ontarians are going to be experiencing flooding from rainstorms and sewer overflows in the months ahead. We thought we'd get you some advice on how to avoid that becoming a multi-thousand dollar headache. Barbara Robinson is president of Norton Engineering, but she's perhaps better known as the Sewer Lady. And she joins us now here in studio. Nice to see you back here again. You too, Steve. Generally speaking, how much do you think people know about the sewer system that we all very much depend on to keep things Clean. Steve, I would say the average resident knows almost nothing about sewers. And this is a problem because the more residents know, the more they can help prevent and reduce uh, flooding for all of us. Why do you think we are so ignorant about it? Well, I guess I would say the, the people who concern themselves with sewers, the engineering people, um, generally don't uh, relate with the public all that much. They don't talk directly to the public, and it's kind of complex. So we, we need to give the public a chance to understand the things we ask them to do and why it's so important. And when you give them that information, how interested are they in getting it? Oh, good gravy. When I, I speak to service groups and universities, I speak constantly to people, and they are on the edge of their seats. I mean, people just don't Seriously. Know I have the lineups after I speak, and this is rotaries onto groups, just, you know, uh, just they're beside themselves. They just don't stop what you're doing. You, go, you have to educate more people, whatever. So, uh, yeah, it's really important. So we actually do want to know. It's just getting yes. there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's consider some of the best practices we could implement to reduce flooding and the costs that come associated with that. And we want to start with reducing the amount of flow in our sewers or flooding our sewers. So let's start with this. What are roof leaders? <laughs> so roof leaders are, we generally, are, we call them downspouts. Roof leaders is the technical term, or whatever. So that, that's a, a pipe that connects the water from your roof uh, and uh, goes down into the sanitary sewer in some cases. Is it legal? 
It's illegal across Canada. Seriously? Yes. These are illegal to use. Yes. But we all use them. Yes. So here's the problem. They're kind of legal non Well, they're not legal. They're illegal. But they mm. were legal when they were built, a lot of them back in the day. Houses before about 1985. They were legal before 1985, but all the houses since are illegal. But it is illegal today per every sewer use bylaw in Ontario and probably Canada. It's illegal in a sewer use bylaw. Why is it illegal? Because it's clean water. And sanitary sewers are supposed to convey sanitary sewage. Now, Toronto is an exception because you have combined sewers in some areas, mm -hmm. so the sanitary and the storm go into the same pipe. But it's the same which problem. Which is not great when we which get is too much not, rain. Which is not great. However, disconnecting your roof leader can help that immeasurably with that. So essentially, you are telling everybody watching this or listening to this right now, if you've got a roof leader on your house, take it apart. Correct. If you have a roof leader going into the ground right. and your house is older than about 1980, it's likely going into the sanitary sewer. And I'll tell you why. Because, you know, when a basement flood happens, there's a tipping point at which the, you know, hydraulic grade line in the sewer just gets that much higher and spills over, you know, into your house as a basement flood. If you even have your own roof leader connected, uh, pardon me, downspout connected, all the water from your roof and you know how much rain is, yeah. there's a lot and it's flashy gets into the pipe and that could just trigger a basement flood in at your house. But not that alone, if either of your neighbors on either side or depending on the hydraulics, even some people in your neighborhood are connected, that big whack of flow just ends up in the sanitary sewer and puts all of your neighbors and you at risk of flooding. Can we do this ourselves or do we need somebody to do it for us? No, you can do this yourself. It's simple. You take a hacksaw, you, you saw your downspout off like a foot above the ground, put an elbow and an extension. You want the extension to be long enough so it's well away from the wall of your house because you don't want the water going down your foundation wall. Right it can get into the weeping tiles and that's another problem so but so you know residents don't realize overflows to Lake Ontario particularly in combined sewers like Toronto mm -hmm. every single drop of connected water from your roof is a hundred percent part of the overflow going to Lake Ontario so you know engineers on the public side have been working for years to reduce the leakage in the public side sewers but half of the leak half of the sewer the length of sewers in a sewer system actually is on the private side meaning owned by individual, owned by homeowners, yeah. not the city. And uh, municipalities across Canada, across North America, have been very loath to tackle this private side uh, drainage uh, contribution to flooding because they think people don't want to do it. And I'm saying people do want to do it. The people I, I talk to are just absolutely amazed. They didn't know about all these risks and all that. So people really want to help. And with climate change coming, some of the best practices I talk about, we can reduce the amount of flow in sewers by 15, 20, 30 percent today by just fixing, improving what we've got, particularly on the private side, so that we've got all that room in the pipe now for the climate change that we're concerned about. That doesn't mean things are never going to flood. There's always risk of flood that we can't get away, get, get away from that risk. But so um, residents themselves can do a lot to help reduce this risk and, and save money. Uh, well, okay, so if everybody tomorrow did what you are recommending tonight, tell us how things would look different. Um, uh, I imagine we'd reduce uh, peaking flow by 30-40%. Like that's, there's a lot of water going into sanitary sewers. So even in a separated sanitary sewer, sewer system like where I live, which means there's a sewer pipe and a, and a storm pipe separately, um, unless uh, the city has initiated a program to disconnect those roof leaders, a lot of them are going into the sanitary sewer. Uh, for separated systems, like 40-50% of the water getting to the sewage treatment plant, of the flow getting to the sewage treatment plant is clean water. So rainwater or groundwater, it shouldn't be there. It's, it's, treatment plants are not supposed to be treating clean water. <laughs> okay, next thing, foundation drains. Are you finding people in newer homes are having them disconnected? Absolutely. So uh, homes built after 1985, because we didn't gravity connect to the sewer, so we weren't automatically connected, they were built with uh, sump pumps. So there's a, a, an area that where the water collects and you've got a sump pump that pumps it out um, to the surface or to a storm sewer or whatever. Um, people don't like dealing with pumps. People are afraid of pumps. It's also related to the sewage system and people are a bit um, loath to deal with sewage. And so um, it's frequently found that people with sump pump connections are disconnected 
connecting them and uh, connecting the water by gravity to the sanitary sewer. Now, uh, weeping tiles from before 1985 are also connected to the sanitary sewer, so that's also a problem that we have to deal with eventually. Mm -hmm. But the immediate thing is those people who have, have um, disconnected their sump pump and redirected the flow by gravity to the sanitary sewer means all that water is also contributing to flooding directly and 100%. So um, one of the reasons people don't like uh, pumps is because they fail, they're afraid of them or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a sump pump, I understand why you might, might want to reconnect to gravity, but um, you're increasing your risk of flooding. Because if you hydraulically connect the sump pump to the sanitary sewer, when there's a sanitary sewer backup, it can get back into your house, whereas pump to surface can't. So you increase your risk of flooding by doing that. And it's and the reason I know this is because plumbers and building inspectors, I work with them constantly, tell me they frequently go into homes and find these things disconnected. Is that illegal as well? Absolutely. It's, it's illegal it's to do that. It's illegal to connect uh, round <laughs> rainwater or groundwater to the sanitary sewer across Canada. Hmm. Absolutely. What should we do about it? So same thing, if you have a disconnect, well, actually, uh, this is a little more difficult for residents to deal with because it's a more expensive solution. Disconnecting a roof leader is about a $50. You're gonna buy an elbow on an extension, that's 50 mm -hmm. bucks, anybody can do that. To disconnect, um, uh, a sump pump, uh, and, uh, to disconnect a gravity connection and go back to a sump pump. Um, people don't want to do this. Um, my solution for this is every time a building inspector from the city goes to someone's house for any reason, mm -hmm. they should proactively go and check the basement plumbing. And if it's it been illegally reconnected, the storm has been illegally reconnected to sanitary sewer, they take a picture, we'll need a database or whatever, and they follow up with an order to disconnect. Hmm. We're there, we have every power, we, we already have all these municipal, municipal powers already. We don't need any new laws, anything. We can, municipalities can start tomorrow doing these kinds of things. If, if the inspectors come around and they find that you have done these things that, that are, and maybe you didn't do them, maybe the person who had the house Perhaps, before you yeah. did, uh, is there a big fine involved or what, what can they do? What punishment can they inflict? Uh, well, municipalities can, through the municipal use bylaw, can can uh, issue an order and charge you any fee they want. I, I think they should charge you $10,000 <laughs> because uh, the cost to society and with climate change coming, all these connections are just making flooding worse and worse. So, yeah. and, and the other thing I'll just say about sump pumps is, you know, if you have a sump pump, uh, you want to be, a sump pump or a backwater valve, you want to be checking that. It's called protective plumbing equipment. It protects your basement from flooding. Mm -hmm. Spring and fall, when you check your smoke detector, and CO detectors, mm -hmm. check your sump pump and check your backwater valve. And when I say ch check your sump pump, make sure it's working. So either pull up on the float or fill it with water and see if the float, uh, see if the pump engages. Hmm. Um, because th that way you'll know it's working. When the big storm comes, you're protected. Let, uh, let me do the math with you here. Uh, house fires, carbon dioxide poisoning, basement flooding. Which of those three happens most frequently? Basement flooding by a very, very, very long shot. And that's the one thing we actually check the least. Uh, we don't check it at all, exactly. And and it, it, people get PTSD now. It's They've done lots of studies. If you have a basement flood with sewage in your basement, I mean, it's, it's a disaster. People lose their possessions and they get PTSD. It's just a terrible thing. So yeah, the risk of, of uh, dying in a fire, you know, we're not talking death with a basement flood, but it's still a serious thing and it's constant. I mean, places like Toronto and Hamilton with the old combined systems experience a lot of basement flooding. It's traumatic for people. So listen, we're doing public service now Announcement spring and fall, uh, check your smoke and CO detectors. Let's say check your uh, protective plumbing equipment as well. Hmm. Okay, let's do, this is where we're really going to get into the... Uh, Nitty gritty? Into the, into the pipes here, okay? <laughs> A question on the notion that toilets are not, are not trash cans. Correct. Okay. How much of a problem is it, for example, women going into the bathroom and they flush sanitary products down the toilet because there are no trash cans... Uh, or uh, either, you know, in the stall, and therefore they have no choice. That's what they do. Correct. How much of that happens? Uh, Steve, this is constantly, this is happening constantly, and, and I actually just discovered this, discovered, just realized a few, <laughs> a few months ago of all things. So per the building codes in Canada, women's stalls are not required to contain trash cans. Now, there's a trash can out by the sinks, mm -hmm. If a woman, so 51% yeah. of the population is uh, female, right. and I looked at our population demographic, about half of all women at any one time are menstruating. 
uh, pardon me, half of women are of menstrual age and 20% uh, are men menstruating at any one time. So uh, a woman's in a washroom stall and she's dealing with soiled materials, soiled hands. There's no trash can, there's no sink, there's nothing. Women's stalls look like men's stalls, they look the same. The only difference is we're provided with a flimsy paper bag that we're supposed to somehow get the product from where it is. Okay, so this, is... this is this for for men who never go in women's washroom stalls. This is what's in women's washroom stalls. This flimsy paper bag. It looks like it leaks. Um, I've been doing a survey with women since the, uh, I realized that this wasn't in the building code. I've never seen, nobody has ever seen a woman walk out of a stall with one of these in their hand, was sort of soiled or whatever. It's, it, we just don't do it. So this is what's been provided in the building codes. Now, the building codes were written 60 years ago and they were written by men. So, so the thing is we need today, I mean, tomorrow, I would like municipalities to start putting trash cans in all of women's washroom stalls so we have a place to put these materials without, you know, we, we can't get this material on our clothing or whatever. So we need something right there that we can use to dispose of it. So a lot of private, um, like restaurants and stuff often have a trash can because uh, the plumbing calls from flushing this sort of thing are, are they're, they're constant. Um, and the other thing is again I, as we uh, as we started when we spoke um, people don't realize how important it is to not flush the stuff because we're not really telling them well let, let's go through the implications yeah, yeah, of that absolutely if, if a lot of these materials get flushed down the toilet take us down the road what happens absolutely so um, uh, flushable wipes are the, actually the worst and they're they're new they have plastic in them but any any uh, thing that doesn't break down in a sewer um, is a place to attract fat soil and grease and fat soil and grease are naturally discharged because we are what we eat and so that's normal in sewers um, it gives these the, these um, chunky things a place to stick so we've started to see fatbergs in sewer systems a lot and fatbergs are literally all this chunky stuff not just sanitary products flushable wipes dental floss all the things that are not supposed to go in sewers they stick with the fat soil and grease and, and build up and there was a fatberg in london england oh, five or six years ago it was the size of a city bus <laughs> and these block the sewers they cause basement mm -hmm. flooding whatever and the only way to get rid of a fatberg is for Men to go, I say men because I've, I've, I've never had to do it myself, but they have to manually chip the fat burger apart with pickaxes and haul mm. it out of there. It's just... Not fun. Ugh. Um, so, uh, you know, people people just don't realize. So uh, flushable wipes, I'll just talk about that. The term flushable simply means it can pass through your toilet trap. It can flush. It doesn't mean it's okay in sewers. In so, fact, it's not okay. It is absolutely. Flushable wipes it. have plastic in them. They should never, ever, ever be flushed. So um, the things you can flush in order of safety, single-ply toilet paper, Two-ply toilet paper. After that, I'm not very happy. Three-ply toilet paper, Kleenex, paper towel, dental floss, sanitary products, diapers, and the, these things clog sewers. And they, here's the thing. When you flush that down your own sewer at home, um, your own sewer, uh, if you live in a house that's 80 years old, your sewer is 80 years old. And even in new sewers, uh, in, in new homes, sometimes the sewers aren't in, in as good condition as, as they should be. So this stuff can easily block. And if you've got other problems in your sewer, this fat soil and grease and all that can block your sewer and cause a basement flood on your own so even in your home you never want to d discharge any of that stuff and the other thing is in the kitchen no fat soils and grease down the down drain, the drain. Yeah. so people I don't know if people do it anymore I can't imagine but I know people used to make bacon and pour that liquid bacon grease down the sink now when you make when the bacon grease is hot, it's liquid. As soon as it gets to the bottom uh, to your sewer, which is underneath your, underneath your floor slab, it solidifies. Mm -hmm. And when plumbers do calls and and there's blockages, they they constantly say, well, you, you you had a big fat bird down there. It was full of this, full of that, full of trash, mm -hmm. full of. So um, residents not only are keeping this stuff out of away from pump stations and sewage treatment plants, but they're protecting their own property from flooding. Why are they allowed to call them flushable wipes if they're not flushable? Here's the thing, the term flushable technically means it can pass through your toilet, but the average resident doesn't know that. So my industry, not me personally, but my industry across North America has been uh, fighting the flush flushable wipes in industry for quite some time. That's not, a, it's not fair to use that term on these products because they're, they're not flushable. Got it. So the other thing about flushing all these things and, and women's washrooms without trash cans, women are away from the home, what, 12 hours a day? Mm -hmm. That's 12 hours a day they're necessarily flushing these products because we have no choice. In places like Toron Toronto that have combined sewer overflows and Lake Ontario ends up full of menstrual products and all that stuff, it's just an unsightly mess. 
The reason that's happening, Steve, a big reason, is because women have no choice during the day, at work, wherever they are, without trash cans, we're flushing, we have no choice, and it ends up in Lake Ontario. So if municipalities would put trash cans, require trash cans uh, in, in every stall so women had a chance to get rid of these things, it's still a bit problematic getting the product to the trash can, to, to be honest, but we would reduce that load at the uh, during overflows, but also the load at the sewage treatment plant, because when all this stuff gets to the sewage treatment plant, it gets screened out with screens or whatever, they have to take those screenings, dump them in trucks and drive them to the landfill and then put mm. them in the landfill. So we don't want this stuff in the public side system, we don't want it at pump stations and we don't want it in women's washroom stalls. Have you lobbied City Hall for these changes? I lobby relentlessly, it's all I do, Steve. And do they not listen? Well, you know, actually the women's, the trash cans and women's stalls, I just figured out a few months ago. So I'm lobbying hard now huh. because this, this, this is a game changer. Okay, you've got a visual yeah, aid here. That's yeah, so, so I just, because these don't exist, I just made up this little sign. Uh, again, this, this whole point about the fact that things go to the, have to be screened out at the wastewater treatment plant. I mean, no one knows that. No it's one just understands. The, just the three P's you want. Pee, poo, and paper. That's all that goes down. Pee, poo, and paper. Uh, and, and, and your kitchen sink, you know, if you make bacon, use a paper towel, wipe it out, put the white, paper towel in your composting, right. whatever. Nothing but, just think about, you don't want anything that could uh, block your sewer or the, or the public sewer. So you, these do not exist. You just made this I up. I just made these up because they don't exist. That's but correct. But they could and perhaps should go in every... I would like these signs in every in, uh, on the back of every uh, stall in Canada, including men's stalls, because men are starting to flush flushable wipes. And the advantage of putting them on the back of a toilet stall is you have undivided attention. You have people's <laughs> undivided attention. That is true. No, I'm serious. We, we, we do talk about these things. I mean, most municipalities don't give the information about why, but sometimes there are bill inserts and stuff. And, you know, municipalities are trying to do all these things, but people don't write, read bill inserts, or at least it's not changing behavior, so. Mm. And as far as, pardon me, I should have said earlier, as far as roof leader disconnection goes, there are municipalities working on that. In, in Toronto, it's currently illegal. I, I mean, they, they are, are uh, it's mandatory now to disconnect roof leaders, mm. but I don't know, the up to, it's always hard to get uptake from residents or whatever, because they really don't want to do these things. But just if residents would understand, if we would disconnect these roof leaders, we'd reduce flooding risk for everybody. And if it becomes kind of socially unacceptable, if you see your neighbor with roof leaders going into the ground, you, you should be thinking, geez, that could cause a flood at my house or whatever. So, um, you know, as a society, these are things that need to change. As they say on the TTC, if you see something, say something. If you see something, say something. There we go. Absolutely. The sewer lady strikes again. <laughs> Barbara Robinson from Norton Engineering, thanks so much for coming in tonight. It's thank, been great. Thank you for having me, Steve. Always a pleasure. Next week on The Agenda. I just don't think that a bearded prophet came down off a mountain with two stone tablets and said, Larry, Sergey, stop rotating your log files and start mining them for actionable market intelligence. Right? <laughs> it is entirely possible to imagine a world in which Amazon drivers are fairly compensated. No one dies in an Amazon warehouse. Suppliers get the fair share of the deal, and we can search the web and find the things that we want without being spied on, all without maybe producing the surpluses that allow Jeff Bezos to buy a comical penis rocket. That's next week on The Agenda. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.